With that, join me in welcoming Brian Sigma. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Sigma, and I'm the communications director for Media Trackers, and we are a conservative nonprofit watchdog organization. We're nonpartisan, but we do uh, have an ideological bent with what we do, and we're honest about that bent. Uh, unlike many in the mainstream media who feel that their work is impartial and unbiased, we are at least honest with people about our bias. And we say that we approach the world from a free market, limited government perspective. And that way, whenever you read our research and look at our stories, you have a grasp of what's taking place and kind of the, the worldview that's influencing our our perspective on things. Um, Media Trackers was started in 2011, actually December of 2010. 2011 was the first year that we were operating here in Wisconsin. I joined in June of 2011 as the communications director right in time for the recall elections. And as you can imagine, of course, everybody that was here in the, at that time, if you're involved in the political process, that was quite an exciting time to be in Wisconsin with plenty of activity uh, on both the left and right and a lot of things to watch on the left. As we did, we went through and exposed some different things that were happening with liberal candidates, uh, and by and large, as we have found, liberal candidates tend to have a D behind their name, although if you've been keeping track of our website recently, you know that we've also uh, been after a number of candidates with an R behind their name because uh, our mission is to be a conservative organization that looks at the facts and tries to provide transparency and hold liberals accountable regardless of their political party. Now, uh, as, as David mentioned, uh, throughout 2011 and, to, and into 2012, we were heavily focused on the political process uh, with the recall election taking place of the state senators in 2011, then of course of Governor Scott Walker and other state senators in 2012, and then of course the fight for the U.S. Senate, and then the fight to keep, for Republicans at least, to try to keep control of the state legislature. We had ample political material to write about and to talk about. But in 2013, we began to shift our focus uh, a little bit, as I fully anticipated we would, because we moved into a period of policy making. The political atmosphere in Wisconsin is still highly charged. There are still deeply held feelings on both sides of the partisan political aisle. But in 2013, the recalls had subsided to the point where Republicans now, being in control and having control of state government, had the responsibility to put together a state budget. They had the responsibility to begin moving forward on a lot of the things they promised when they were elected in 2010. Of course, in the early part of 2011, those were the heady days when voter ID passed and when other reforms, concealed carry passed, and there was a lot of interesting behind-the-scenes work with some of the old guard Republicans that had been around for a while, uh, hesitant to perhaps support the bold reforms that were being uh, touted at the time. But in 2013, we had a chance to kind of really look at the governing priorities of the Republican Party, because now that they had secured for themselves victory both in 2010 and in 2012 and survived various recall elections, they now had uh, an opportunity to demonstrate in the relative calm uh, where their priorities lie and, and what their principles were and how they were going to apply those principles to, to government. Well, when the budget came out, uh, needless to say, it, it was a step in the right direction from previous budgets, but unfortunately, even though we've had Republicans uh, in control of now two budgets since uh, Governor Jim Doyle uh, and, and the Democrat-controlled Senate were leading the way, and then of course for a while a Democrat-controlled Assembly, uh, Wisconsin's state budget uh, this year, and actually for the next two years, is larger than any budget we've ever had in the state of Wisconsin's history. That means that despite the fact that we have had a shift in ideology in who controls the state capital in Madison, there has not yet been a shift in governing priorities. And when it comes to the overall baseline budget, we now spend more than we've ever spent before. Uh, the, the last budget did not have the same tax hikes. In fact, it contained tax cuts, which I consider to be a net positive for the state of Wisconsin from a conservative fiscal standpoint. We were able to see a $600 million tax cut pushed through, of course, then in December of 2013. Uh, Governor Walker, or, or December of, uh, of, of 12 and then thir or of 13, uh, Governor Walker pushed through an income tax cut with help from Republicans in the legislature. So we've had several tax cuts that have come forward since January of 2013, but uh, there is still a, a reluctance, it seems, on the part of those in Madison to really embrace conservative fiscal policy when it comes to the overall state budget. I'll talk a little bit now about kind of the, the aspect that we saw from the budget, and then I want to go into some detail about looking forward, what we can perhaps expect after this election. So there's going to be a little bit of back and forth as I go along today, talking about the, the impact of policy on the state of Wisconsin, but then also talking about the impact of political elections on that policy. Because elections uh, do have consequences, and I would maintain that on August 12th, 
we're going to see what's perhaps more important for Republicans, uh, the outcome of those elections will matter more than the outcome of the November elections. Uh, the only reason for that being is because Republicans are not projected to lose either the Assembly or the State Senate. Uh, I do feel that at this point, Governor Scott Walker is in a strong position to retain the governor's mansion. And on August 12th, uh, primaries will be decided that determine what kind of Republicans will go to Madison. And it's really the quality and the caliber of the Republicans that end up in Madison that determine the quality and caliber of legislation that emerges over the next two years from, from, from a fiscal standpoint as well as from a tax cut standpoint. Uh, there's, there's a whole gamut of issues that will be covered but uh, the, the way they're covered will be really largely determined by who wins some of these key primaries across the state on August 12th. In the 2013-2015 biennial budget, uh, there was uh, some major changes that were put forward, as I mentioned, a tax cut plan, but overall spending went up. In fact, uh, under that budget, the proposal was made to increase the number of government workers by 700. Now that's equivalent of the largest Boeing 747 landing at Mitchell International Airport and disgorging an entire aircraft full of new government workers who can now collect government salaries, government pensions, and government funded health care. Uh, that's quite a lot when you really look at the, the size of state government and what uh, the, the priorities have been advertised as being on the campaign trail. So we talked about that, and by the time we got done, I think we were able to, the, the state budget did see less than 700 new government employees, but there were a number of new government employees. 80 of them were Department of Revenue Enforcement agents, which I find interesting. If you're in the middle of passing tax cuts, why do you need to hire 80 new enforcement agents to go out and collect money from lower taxes? Uh, but that was kind of an interesting measure where there's been for a while in Madison a, uh, a, a, a sort of inertia that's developed as bureaucrats have survived from one administration to the next and as cabinet officials uh, appointed by Governor Scott Walker have had to wrestle with how they are going to take their agency and steer it in a more conservative direction. And they've not always been successful with that so far, in part that's due to civil service laws that are currently on the books. I tend to be an opponent of the civil service system. Civil service system was a progressive idea that grew out of the, the reforms of the early 20th century that said we need to have experts running government because if we have dispassionate experts running government, they will always do what's right. Well, I think we actually kind of regard them as bureaucrats today, not dispassionate experts. And as we have found, whenever you're not, when your job is not up for re-election and when you're never held accountable by the voters, for some reason you always find a reason to keep your job around and you always find a reason to add more people to work for you and to increase your budget and to increase your salary. So it maybe started off as a, as a well-intentioned idea, but it quickly went awry. And today we now have, uh, safely ensconced in state statute, civil service protections that mean that even though a conservative co is appointed to run a state agency, they are not free to immediately terminate all the employees under them. I'm of the opinion that whenever a new, new CEO comes into a company, they should be completely free to fire anybody who is not performing up to the standards that they need to have to meet the new objectives of the company under the new leadership. In Wisconsin, though, we get to hire new CEOs and people to work for that CEO when they go to Madison, but they have to work with the same workforce. And fundamentally, the problem can be when you have a bad workforce and you have an executive leadership team that is you know, hampered by that underperforming workforce, but is also uh, hamstrung by maybe a, an unwillingness to engage in a heavy political debate over the priorities of that agency, what's going to result is more of the same. And so as the state budget came out, it contained a lot of proposals from state agencies that were run by Republicans because they had been appointed by a Republican governor, but still had a lot of the people left over from the Doyle administration, from the, the Thompson administration, and I, and I do appreciate the conservative reforms Governor Thompson brought forward with school choice, and I think he had some great ideas on welfare reform. But those were the days whenever the, the economy was strong, and if you're a Republican, it didn't matter how much you spent, you could never spend enough. Well, those days are over, and I think the, 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 the collision course that was set up in the 1990s with an ever-growing state government is now colliding with fiscal reality, and the problem we're now facing in the state is how do we fund these positions, and how do we continue to manage the growth of government? I think that whenever an elected official decides their job is to manage the growth of government instead of to fundamentally reduce the size and scope of government, They've made a fundamental concession to the, the liberal perspective, which is that government can actually solve a lot of the problems facing our state, our communities, and our families today. 
Well, as that budget came out, there was a plan in there to increase the amount of money, uh, as is actually done in almost every state budget, for the state stewardship fund. Stewardship fund is a very common sense sounding idea when you think about it. There's state parks across the state of Wisconsin that all of us have the opportunity to enjoy. I actually enjoy a lot of our state parks, enjoy hiking and canoeing and kayaking in those, those parks and in those areas. But the stewardship fund was designed by the state to continually add land to the state park roles and also to add land to state property roles. Not all land owned by the state actually ends up as a state park. Some of it ends up as state forest land, some of it ends up in various uh, projects that they use to, to, to manage the, the environment. And I understand, I'm a big fan of wise stewardship of the environment, but at some point in time, we do have to ask ourselves as a state the question, when is enough enough? How much land does the state need to own for state parks? How much land does the state need to own to, to, to maintain common sense uh, areas like floodplains and make sure that our wetlands are, are properly drained? And how much of the private sector land do we need to continue to have the state buy up? And couldn't we perhaps have an alternative in place that will allow private sector individuals, individuals who actually have a stake in that land because they own it, take care of that property instead of using that land to kind of increase the amount of property controlled by the state? Well, we began writing about that, and one of the things we discovered was that uh, several years ago, the state of Wisconsin, in the stewardship program, decided to buy a golf course that was owned by a donor of several political candidates. And they bought that golf course in southeast Wisconsin for about $1,600 an acre. Now, that golf course was actually not quite worth the amount of money they spent on it. In another case, we found they were, they were purchasing land through the stewardship fund for about $20,000 an acre. And these weren't developed lots in a the neighborhood. These were basically rural lots. They weren't even lots. There was rural land that was being purchased by the state and held in a state trust fund or in a state trust to preserve it and to make sure it remains as, as, as property that the all, entire citizens, all the citizens of the state of Wisconsin can enjoy. Well, when we begin looking at how a, a program managed by bureaucrats, funded by politicians, is then paying back the political donors of some of those politicians by buying their land at a higher than market value, you have to ask yourself, is this program worth continuing? After doing a series of stories about the, the waste in the, pro in the program, after examining how much land the state of Wisconsin already owns, lawmakers did trim back the appropriation they made to the stewardship fund for new land acquisitions. I think that was a step in the right direction, but as I said a few minutes ago, when we're talking about managing the growth of government, we're still talking about growing government. And that's what they did, unfortunately, with the stewardship fund. Other projects that came up, we looked at the Circus World Museum. I'm just curious, how many of you have ever been to the Circus World Museum in Baraboo? All right, fair number of you, good. Well, the Circus Museum has had some financial difficulties in recent years. Now, a lot of people go there, it's in Baraboo, it's a little bit out of the way. People tend to go to the Wisconsin Dells. Uh, they don't tend to stop off and look at the Circus Museum as much. And sitting on the board of directors of the Circus Museum, a private organization, is Senator Fred Risser, actually one of the longest serving state lawmakers in U.S. history. I think he was there when the Civil War began. Uh, there's a, a building named for his family in downtown Madison, the Risser Justice Center, it's the headquarters of the Wisconsin Department of Justice. His family has had a long ties to Wisconsin state government, and Senator Risser sits on the board of the Wisconsin Circus Museum. Well, Wisconsin has what's called an open records law. It means that any single citizen can go to the state official and say, we'd like to see this record in your possession. And then outside of case files for criminal investigations and outside of uh, files related to minors and education, uh, those files are open for examination. And so we filed an open records request, and we at Media Trackers filed an open records request with Senator Risser's office and asked for any copies of any information he had about the Circus Museum. Well, being an old school politician, Senator Risser doesn't operate a personal email account. He does have a state email account. And that's all he uses when he uses email. So into our possession came about 800 pages of board meeting minutes and internal projections and financial statements about a private organization that was now lobbying the state government to take them over and to turn them into a separate state agency. Then that set up a fight, though, between the Wisconsin Historical Society, which is also funded by your taxpayer money and by the money that you pay when you visit a Wisconsin historic site run by them, but it is also funded by your taxpayer money, uh, between the Wisconsin Historical Society and the Circus Museum, and both sides decided to lobby up, so they hire expensive lobbyists, and they hired, one, one side hired a PR marketing firm out of Milwaukee 
with taxpayer money to lobby the legislature to get them to approve of a $2 million plan that would have taxpayers buying the circus museum and turning every employee at the museum into a state employee, which means they now have civil service protections, so you can't really fire them. They would have health insurance benefits that frankly aren't available to me in the private sector and probably aren't available to you in the private sector, they're that nice. They would have access to the state pension system, which is a pretty good program right now, all because they're a museum that was bought by the state of Wisconsin. Well, we began writing about that and talking about that, and we pointed out how taxpayer money was funding a lobbying effort to convince your elected officials and my elected officials to give this organization yet more taxpayer money. So yes, they're using your money against you to get more of your money. And as we began to tell that story, some lawmakers reacted, several people were upset. I had someone at a PR firm email me and say that I had gotten all my facts wrong and that really it wasn't state money in the first place. It was just in the state budget, but it was program revenue, so it wasn't really state money. <laughs> and I said, well, I understand there's different ways of getting money into the state budget, program revenue, GPR funding, segregated fees, and all of that. But as far as I am concerned, if my elected official votes on that, that means that somewhere along the line, I, the taxpayer, am going to be held accountable if that program revenue doesn't come through. They're going to immediately go to the general revenue fund because it's a state obligation. And they're going to begin pulling money from my tax dollars and from your tax dollars. And as we hammered that point home, it resonated with legislators. They understood that this wasn't a matter of a separate entity being able to have money uh, that was already coming in that would just be managed by the state. But once it became part of the state, it would forever be the responsibility of the state and of, therefore, state taxpayers to make sure that the program was, uh, and the museum were run in accordance to what uh, the, the public wanted, with what the board of directors wanted. Uh, after we wrote stories about it, the legislature specifically struck that portion from the budget. And then, after removing that portion from the budget, the head of the Wisconsin Circus Museum uh, resigned. He was a former state lawmaker who had been apparently hired because of his connections to other lawmakers to lobby them. So we can see that he was maybe perhaps not as devoted to the circus museum as everyone thought, but maybe he was a little bit more devoted to his paycheck and being able to lobby his fellow lawmakers or former colleagues. And when that plan uh, did not pan out, he decided to go search for work elsewhere. So uh, I guess we contributed to entering another fine individual into the job market somewhere. And uh, I'm not too ashamed of that. So those are some of the, the, the fights that we've had, some of the debates and discussions that have happened in Madison. Another plan that was not included in the state budget but uh, did not get a lot of coverage was uh, a, a really a fight between conservatives in the, in the state assembly and the Wisconsin Dental Association. Now the Wisconsin Dental Association is just a group, of, it's a, a professional group, a trade group of dentists across the state and it's natural for any industry to have a trade group that will at least get together to discuss best practices and, and examine ways state regulations impact them. But unfortunately what the Wisconsin Dental Association did this past session was go to the state legislature and ask them to completely rewrite the contracts they have with insurance companies. And as I've done more research into this issue, this is not uncommon in Wisconsin. Typically, if I was to have a contract with someone, we would sit down, we'd outline the services, we'd outline the agreement, here's what I'm going to be providing you, in return, here's what you're going to be providing me, the consideration for that work done. Whether it's a, I provide a service, you provide me money, I provide you money, you provide me a service or some exchange of services, but a contract is an agreement between two private parties to actually accomplish a mutually beneficial end. Well, a lot of, a lot of uh, dentists uh, accept insurance, and so therefore they tend to work with these insurance companies to make sure that they're in network and they have different agreements about the kind of plans that they will uh, accept, the type of coverage that they'll include in their plans, uh, as well. and so the dentists work with insurance companies to make sure that the dentist will be able to provide a service that's covered by the insurance company. The insurance company will negotiate with the dentist to uh, agree upon a fee for that service so that when you or I walk in, if we have a dental insurance, we can actually get that service for the set price that was agreed upon between the insurance company that represents us and the doctor who's doing the work on us. Now, the problems with health insurance aside, and dental insurance is a little different than general health insurance, but the problems with dental insurance aside and health insurance aside, that represents a contract between a dentist and an insurance company. Well, a lot of the dentists were getting upset with how the insurance companies were negotiating the contracts. And typically, if you're in any other industry, what you do is if you don't like the terms of the contract, you try to find a way out of it, you try to cancel the contract, you each side lawyers up, you take it to court, you fight over it in court, or you go to arbitration and you work out a deal that will at least hopefully 
meet some of the, the, the needs of both sides as the contract is enforced. But no, the Wisconsin Dental Association didn't want to go the tough route and hire their own attorneys. They decided to write campaign checks to lawmakers and then go to those lawmakers and say, hey, can you pass a law outlawing these portions of our contract and say, you know what, it's against state, Wisconsin state law to have that in a contract? And believe it or not, the Wisconsin state legislature did just that. Even though Republicans controlled both the Senate and the Assembly, Republican lawmakers quickly fell in line behind the Wisconsin Dental Association, passed a law outlawing certain con contractual language and making it null and void in the state of Wisconsin. So even if the insurance company had taken the dental association and the dentist they represent to court, a state court would have sided with the dentist saying, well, the law has been changed. Your contract's null and void on these points. We can't enforce it. You can't enforce it. Well, as we did research into this, uh, there was a senator who tends to be somewhat conservative, Senator Frank Lassay from up in uh, the Green Bay area, not too far from here. And Senator Lassay has actually been a champion on some issues. He uh, was very instrumental uh, in 2011 in drawing attention to uh, a plan by several government bureaucrats to build an Obamacare exchange in Wisconsin. And Senator Lassay, uh, I think, worked very wisely with other conservatives to make it known that he didn't feel that was the best thing to be, that, would, that could be done. And shortly after he put up that fight and after we at Media Trackers wrote a number of reports looking at that plan, the governor came out and said, you know what, we're not going to spend Wisconsin taxpayer money on an Obamacare exchange. This is the federal government's problem. They get to build it. They get to own it. We're not going to have taxpayers in Wisconsin responsible for it. I think that was the right decision to make. Senator Lassay has done some good things in the past, but on this issue he was wrong, I think. Several days after accepting a check for several thousand dollars from the Wisconsin Dental Association's Political Action Committee conduit, in other words, the dentists run their money through this conduit to follow it to certain lawmakers, Senator Lassay promptly introduced the very legislation that they wanted that would nullify contractual uh, language between themselves, between the dentist and dental insurance companies. And we called him out on that, and you know the response that we got was, well, that's just a coincidence. <laughs> well, we're talking about contracts here, so I'm not saying there's a formal contract between any lawmaker and a donor, but certainly when a donor comes in and puts money on the table, it certainly makes a politician more willing to listen to what they have to say and to perhaps do their bidding, and that's how the process works. I'm not faulting him for it, but at the same time, I'm sure glad nobody faulted us for exposing it, because I think that's something that's important for the public to be aware of. If money is coming in, several thousand dollars worth, and five or six days later, a bill is introduced that directly benefits the financial standing of the donor and is actually a special interest bill designed for them, I think that's worth pointing out. Well, these types of fights have occurred over time, and some people have not uh, liked the fact that we at Media Trackers have, have gone off and uh, exposed this. We've been called rogue. We've been said that we're damaging the Republican Party. And I say, well, frankly, you know, it's... Uh, not our job to defend the reputation of the Republican Party. If politicians want to have a better reputation, then maybe they can act with better motives and conduct themselves in a better way, and then they'll have a better reputation. <laughs> exactly. Imagine that. Maybe they could uh, take responsibility for their own actions. So those are some of the fights that have unfolded recently, but uh, looking ahead, on, on as we look to 2014, or 2015, after the 2014 elections, I think that we're going to really see uh, the possibility that the next state budget is more conservative than the state budget we got in 2013. And the reason I say that is because we're going to see a state Senate that is fundamentally changed from its current makeup. Now, Republicans, I believe, from what we can tell, will continue to hold the state Senate. They'll st still have the majority. But we're losing Senator Mike Ellis. I'm sure that disappoints everybody in this room to know that we're losing Senator Mike Ellis. And we're going to lose State Senator Dale Schultz, who's already a lost cause anyway. And uh, down at the 21st Senate District, there's a, a hotly contested primary underway, and I really don't know who's going to win that one, between uh, former GOP Senator, State Senator Van Weingard and conservative businessman Jonathan Stites. And uh, if you've been reading any of the blogs lately, you'll kind of know Media Trackers has been bashed as being a liberal organization. We're in the pockets of the liberal special interest now because we dared to point out that uh, a former state senator, Senator Van Weingard, was actually not as conservative as he says he was or says he is. Uh, numerous times he has misled the public about his stance of concealed carry. Uh, at one point in time, when he was on the Racine County Board, he sponsored a resolution condemning coal-fired power plants. Where else have we heard somebody condemning coal-fired power plants recently? I don't know. Not in Wisconsin, maybe in the national level. Yeah. 
So we've pointed out these inconsistencies in these liberal facts in his record, and it's not been very popular for us to do, and so I'm sure that if I walked into any meeting in Racine right now, I would not be welcome, so that's why I came up to the Appleton. Uh, uh, thank you. But as, uh, for now, exactly. But as the, that primary unfolds, I think that is going to also determine what type of legislation will be introduced because uh, Jonathan Stites has said he is very much in favor of right to work. And uh, Senator Wangard, former Senator Wangard, recently came out saying he is in favor of right to work. But he just now found the light of day on that issue, and so I tend to kind of trust the guy who's always been for it, not the guy who recently came to that position. Uh, because when you come to positions quickly as a politician with an electioneering, it kind of seems like you're posturing a little bit, and it's kind of hard to take that uh, as a serious issue. But I think one of the things that we could see introduced in 2015, uh, rather, is right to work. And if that happens, I think if we have uh, State Senator Roth from this area, and we have State Senator Howard Markline, if he gets elected down in Senator Schultz's seat, and we also get somebody like Jonathan Stites out of the 21st Senate District, we'll have three new lawmakers that will be shifting the balance of power from the moderates in the state Senate to the conservative wing of the, of the state Senate majority. Guys like Tom Tiffany are already solid conservatives. I'm also uh, excited to see State Representative Steve Noss running for a state Senate seat that's currently held by a Republican, but uh, Senator uh, Representative Noss is kind of known for taking no prisoners. I uh, talked to him once during the budget fight, and uh, he said, you know what, I am just sick and tired of Republicans spending money. He says, I'm ready to start shooting from behind every tree, behind every rock. I'm going to do a very vicious retreat, he said. I'm going to make sure I exact a price. Well, that attitude has actually surprised some people, and they're a little scared about him getting in the state Senate. Now, I don't know why they're scared. I'm actually looking forward to that kind of attitude in the state Senate. Uh, because if somebody like him walks in there, I don't think that a senator like Rob Coles should be able, when it comes time to have a state budget, throw his ideas on the table and say, I need to have this, this, and this watered down before I vote for the budget. Why can't we have a conservative who walks in there and says, I need you to cut this spending, cut this item of spending, and cut this item of spending, and increase this tax cut, and then I'll vote for the state budget. The problem that often happens with Republicans who stay in government for too long, and this is the same problem that Democrats have, although they usually start off this way, <laughs> is they get excited about governing. They get excited about having their hands in the levers of power, and that becomes the be-all, end-all, where we have to do this to maintain our power. We have to make very small incremental steps. And we've seen this on the national level play out. We've had uh, the national GOP, led by Speaker John Boehner in the House and by Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in the Senate, time and time again promise they're going to fight on something and then promptly cave. Now, I understand that we don't control the White House as, as, as conservatives, and certainly even if we had a Republican in the White House, it wouldn't necessarily mean they are conservative. But when your first instinct is to retreat on an issue or to always buy into the need to spend more money or to expand government, then let's not be surprised when four or five years down the road we find out that the state is somewhat changed but is not as good as it could be in terms of the steps that have been taken towards free market reforms. What is needed by conservatives, and what I've noted as I've researched the budget, as I've watched the political fight unfold, is for conservatives to play outside the system. That scares people. You know, I've, I've talked to people about our stories and our reports at Media Tractors, and they'll say, well, don't you know you're hurting yourself? You know, you're not gonna, that elected official is not going to like you. They're not going to come give you a story down the road. Oh, well. I don't work as a communications director for Media Trackers to be liked. There's a lot of other jobs I could have if I wanted to be liked. That's not one of them, where you end up being liked by a lot of people all the time. But if you stick to your guns, and people know that you're going to call out hypocrisy, you're going to call out spending, and you don't care whether it's by Republicans or by Democrats, that builds a healthy respect. It may not be a respect where they like you. It may be more of a respect where they fear you finding out about something. But that's kind of the approach that we saw with Senator Ted Cruz and the shutdown of the federal government. I was actually on my honeymoon over that shutdown. Um, pulled up to go on the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway in Virginia, and it was shut down. Gates were closed. Said due to the federal government shut down, you know, this highway is closed. So what I did was I promptly walked up to the gate, jumped over it, and went for a stroll. <laughs> if they really didn't want me there, they probably had somebody there watching. But as far as I was concerned, I paid for it, I bought it, it's mine. Uh, and the same should be said for any taxpayer. It was kind of a shenanigan by the federal government to shut down the parks whenever there was no need to. But 
the the flaw of what the, the of the government shutdown was really there was no end game, no strategy that was in place to really decide what was going to happen after we go several days into this. But the fact that it happened, I think, is a good thing. I disagree with how it ultimately came out. I think it probably should have been resolved sooner. I think that there, Senator Cruz and others should have had a better strategy for dealing with it. But it was a moment where a conservative drew a line in the sand and said, "Test me. You don't believe I'm not going to shut. You don't believe we're going to block funding on these issues and make sure that our voice is heard." And time and again, time and time again, we see liberals, whether it's an organization, whether it's a political candidate, whether it's in government as an elected official fighting tooth and nail for what they believe in. But when a conservative or a so-called conservative steps up to the plate and says, I'm going to fight for five minutes and then I'm going to flop like I'm a Spanish soccer player. <laughs> I'm going to make it look good like I fought really hard, but I'm going to flop. And then I'm going to ask everybody to stand up and support me for when I run for re-elect because, hey, at least I flopped good and it looked really good on camera. And at least you thought I was conservative and I, I got hit really hard. Then you go back and watch the replay of it turns out that they didn't really stand for anything. There was quietly a decision behind the scenes to knock out support early, to, to reach a deal, to, to cut, a, to cut a, a compromise or something. And I understand compromise is part of government. But too often there's this focus that conservatives have that we have to be liked by the mainstream media, we have to be liked by people. Now, I think we can be liked. I think that we should be happy warriors. Conservatives aren't grouchy people. We actually are the ones that are optimistic about the future of this country. We're not the ones proposing a radical social reengineering of this country. So sure, we're pretty optimistic about it the way it is. But we have to be happy with but we can't, uh, we can't back down and we can't let people in the political class talk us out of our beliefs, talk us out of our principles. I think that in 2015 it would be great if we saw right to work introduced. The liberals actually have the gall right now of talking about how Wisconsin ranks among the worst in the nation for job creation. Well, that's actually not completely true. We've, saw, we've seen tremendous job growth under Governor Scott Walker thanks to a lot of the reforms that have been done. Reforms in licensing, reforms in the regulations that businesses have to go through. There's still a ton more work to do. Tax cuts have now actually made us more competitive with some of our states, some of the states surrounding us. But I saw, uh, saw recently a liberal organization that was blasting conservatives. And they said, you know what, you look at states like Tennessee, look at states like South Carolina, look at states like Indiana, look at states like Michigan, and look at states like Minnesota, and they've got a better job creation record than we do here in Wisconsin. Well, I looked at that list and I thought, that's kind of interesting. Let me look at that list again. Four of those states are right-to-work states. I don't remember Democrats being in favor of right-to-work, but four of those states are right-to-work states. And one state that's not, Minnesota, has one of the most robust mining industries anywhere in the country because there, Democrats have finally figured it out. It doesn't matter how good you look on camera when you're hanging next to your environmental buddies. We can actually do... Uh, we can actually mine responsibly in a way that does respect the environment, but a way that also provides a stimulating effect to our economy and meets the needs of American, uh, the American economy and the global marketplace. And so they have a thriving mining economy, whereas here in Wisconsin, there's not a single mine in Wisconsin that mines for iron ore. We're still trying to get it through. We still have opposition from liberals up north who are trying to find every way they can to block the iron mine from going in, even though Wisconsin is number three in the country for iron ore deposits. And we're the only state with that level, high level of a deposit that is not making economic use of it right now. So if liberals want to talk about how great other states are, I say let's talk about it. And let's talk about the reason for that. Minnesota doesn't have ridiculous mining regulations. In Minnesota, the government bureaucrats think it's their job to make sure that they watch the mining companies, to make sure that they don't violate uh, the, the agree terms of the agreement when it comes to maintaining a, a, a proper environmental impact. But they don't believe it's their job to harass the company every step of the way and find reasons for them not to become involved in the iron mining industry or the copper industry they have over there. So as we look ahead, I think there's a lot of work to be done. But I think the answer to that work rests with everybody in this room. You know, you're going to work hard probably this election. You all have your candidates that you're supporting. But come January of next year, uh, I'd encourage you to check out our website. Hold your government officials accountable. And when you see them spending too much money, don't be afraid to call them up and say, hey, you know what, I know there's people asking you to spend money, but it's my money. Can you maybe spend a little bit less of it? Could we maybe have a little bit more of a tax cut and not a special interest giveaway? Could we maybe get government out of the role of negotiating private contracts with people? And we have a minimum markup law in the state of Wisconsin. I would love for the minimum markup law to be done away with. <laughs> the only problem is retailers don't. Yeah. Now, why don't retailers want to get rid of the minimum market? Well, it kind of protects the good old boy network. 
where, hey, I always know that no matter what I do, whatever my product I get in for, whatever the cost of getting my product into my store is, I'm always going to be able to market up this much and my competitors won't undercut me. Well, I think it's good if people undercut each other. And then we can decide, is that product worth it? If it wasn't worth it, we paid too little for it, then we're going to go find a better product somewhere else. But I think it should be consumers who are deciding this type of the, the prices and what they're willing to pay. It shouldn't be a state law that says you have to mark up certain products by a certain percentage point to be able to function as a business, as a retailer in the state of Wisconsin. I think getting rid of the civil service uh, system at this point would be a great idea, or at least making strong strides to reduce it. Because the fact of the matter is, a government job is not a right. It's a privilege. <laughs> government job is nobody's right. If you work hard at it and you're kept on board by your employer, great. But if you're incompetent, then there should be absolutely nothing in state statute protecting you from the consequences of your own stupidity. So we should work hard to reform civil service reform. I think that'd be a great idea. I think right to work, as I mentioned, would be a wonderful step in the right direction. Wisconsin's manufacturing industry needs right to work if it is going to compete with states like Michigan. Michigan is not a conservative state by any stretch of the imagination, but it has right to work. It's the home of the big three. It has right to work now. Who would have ever thought that happened? That would have happened. And now we have in Wisconsin, we've got medium-sized and small manufacturers across the state that would benefit from right to work. Of course the labor unions are going to oppose it. They fought Act 10. Look how much good that did them. If conservatives unite and get behind a couple of big ideas and say, we want this to happen, it can happen. And that's why we saw Governor Walker, I think, come out and say that he's opposed to Common Core now. Why did that happen? That happened because people decided to hold his feet to the fire. And Governor Walker wisely decided to respond to the will of the people and not to the will of education bureaucrats at the Department of Public Instruction that had already moved down the path of implementing it without any legislative approval, without any legislative oversight, without any executive approval from the governor. That's the type of, what we saw happen with the Common Core debate needs to happen time and time and time again. Pick your battles wisely. We need, you know, there's, there's a talk now of, you know, should we impeach the president? I think it's a stupid idea to try. I understand we're all as conservatives frustrated with what's happened in Washington, D.C. But if we took the energy that would be devoted to a long shot idea like that, which will never happen because we don't control the U.S. Conservatives don't control the U.S. Senate, and even if Republicans did control the U.S. Senate, there wouldn't be enough courage to do it. Let's focus that kind of uh, energy on positive reforms that can be made to the state of Wisconsin. We have a point in time where conservative ideas should, in theory, prevail. But because politicians are politicians, they won't prevail unless conservatives beat a path to their doorstep and demand that they take action and hold them accountable. So with that, I think, David, do we have time for questions? Is that, uh... Let's do a few questions. Excellent. Uh, I want to just sneak one in right away, if I may. Uh, I was really piqued by the story. I, I hadn't followed the one about the dental association. Mm -hmm. and right away, I'm thinking, what about the prohibitions against ex post facto law and impairment of contracts? How did that play out? Well, uh, for whatever reason, everybody seemed to, after the statute, after the law passed, the bill was signed into law and became part of the state statute, everybody seemed to kind of accept that as the new status quo. And I don't know if it's because neither side or if, the, if the, uh, the insurance industry didn't want to litigate it because it would cost so much. Because insurance companies, as you know, health insurance companies are actually very adept at adopting new tactics for their environment. That's one of the reasons now why insurance companies are not opposed to Obamacare. They've geared up for it. They're very much status quo players. Um, which is why I don't think we've seen them fighting back against Obamacare. It's why they haven't been the ones that would have fought the, 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 the rewrite of the contracts that they had with dentists. Uh, it's not only the dental association, though, or it's not only the, the dental industry. There's also a, a fight right now uh, that recently happened with franchise owners, uh, and particularly car dealers. Um, some of you may remember there was a dispute between whether or not credit unions could sell cars. And a lot of car dealers, which have to go through a lot of hoops because the way state statute is written, were upset that credit unions were selling cars, even though both of them actually serve a sort of consumer-oriented business. Credit unions providing a service to, to their members and financial services, uh, and then, of course, regular car dealers providing cars. And there was, a, there was a, a, certainly a strong disagreement between the two. Credit unions saying, well, sure, we should be able to sell without having extra restrictions. I think that's a great idea. But unfortunately, the way it was, the state law is written now, we've actually written a, a provisions into state law that will nullify certain provisions of a contract between an automotive, automotive dealer and the automotive company that they're a dealer for. So GM can come to Wisconsin and say, look, we need Bob Smith Chevrolet to become a certified Chevy uh, dealer for us, and they sign a franchise agreement. Part of that contract, no matter what it says, will always be void 
under Wisconsin state law because there's a provision there that dealerships wanted that would always give them an advantage over the car manufacturers that make the cars they sell. Now, I'm not opposed to dealers trying to get an advantage, but I don't think they should be using state law to get the advantage. I think they should be using market forces. They should be using competition. And if they really want to fight it, they should lawyer up and go to court over it, just like the rest of us would have to do. So surprisingly, as we go through state statute, and as I've been looking at some of this, and as I talk to people that are involved in the process, there are a lot of areas where private contracts in Wisconsin have to follow certain portions of state law. And we're not talking about laws requiring contracts to be fair or everything fully disclosed. Those are basic playing ground, ground rules that government has a right to, to put in place. We're talking about where both sides know what's going on, but one side lobbied the legislature to get them to tell, uh, to, to, to write in a state statute uh, an exemption for certain parts of the contract that they just frankly don't want to abide by. Yes, sir. What's your organization's uh, standpoint on the WEDC? Uh, yes, uh, he asked uh, what our organization's standpoint is in WEDC. Well, I always make the standard disclaimer, we're not a lobbying organization, so we don't take a position on legislation or candidates. However, I think that the WEDC uh, came from good intentions, completely good motives. What is the WEDC? Uh, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. They're, uh, they replaced the State Department of Commerce as the means that the state was going to use to attract job growth to Wisconsin. Um, I think if, if they had taken the political energy it took to create the WDC and had passed a bigger tax cut, that would have been a wiser decision. I think the WDC has really been a disaster up until this point. And, and I understand there's well-meaning people that are behind it, and it was a well-meaning plan. But when government comes in and tries to rig the system in favor of certain businesses or offer special deals for businesses who are moving to the state, they disadvantage those businesses and those employers that are already in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I think that whenever the state endorses that kind of uh, disparate treatment, that's a slap in the face to every business owner that's already in Wisconsin that can't move their business here because they're already here. I don't see anything that requires us to favor out-of-state businesses moving here over the businesses that are here. Free market will allow us to thrive, and I think reducing the tax burden would be better than trying to use a state agency to kind of be a, a PR thing um, for Wisconsin to hand out special deals. Yes, ma'am. So when are you running for, for either state or federal office? <laughs> well, um, and and uh, where, where does the state stand on affirmative action? Uh, two questions. If I ask if I'm ever running for state or federal office, the answer to that is I can guarantee you it's not anytime soon with the number of people I have upset at me. Uh, the other question, the other question was uh, where does the state stand with affirmative action? And actually, this is a story that we've not been uh, focusing a lot on, but the University of Wisconsin has has announced that it's taking more steps towards affirmative action. Um, and you know, I, I do understand the reason behind affirmative action. It was designed to right inequities that existed because of, of, of long-standing racial bias uh, in the South. And frankly, that was an unfortunate part of uh, the Reconstruction era, whether you agree or disagree with how Reconstruction went, there was a lot of racism. And I understand that there is some common sense in requiring state institutions, not private institutions, state institutions, to. Uh, to, to, to make sure that, that when their acceptance rates, they're giving due process to anyone regardless of their race or their gender. Uh, so I think anybody that discriminates on the basis of race or gender is making a mistake. Uh, unfortunately, though, affirmative action has become a sort of reverse discrimination where you're discriminated against be by your, the, the organizations and entities can discriminate against you. In this case, UW can discriminate against you in applying and becoming accepted as a student because you don't meet one of the qualifications on their list. So do I appreciate the principles behind affirmative action, the idea of making sure that everybody has a fair shot, absolutely the problem is not everybody has a fair shot under affirmative action. It's, it's, it's biased and tilted uh, against uh, certain classes of people, and I would argue that's fundamentally unfair, which, ironically enough, fairness is a big thing for the left, except that it involves taxpayers, anybody else that they don't like, anybody that's not a favorite class. What's that? White male. Well, they, they go after that. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting ways in which the left uh, really seems to lose their fairness argument whenever classes that they don't favor come up. Um, one more question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just, I might, uh, some of you are going to ask some questions, so I'll yeah. make sure you understand the answer. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm the guy that's responsible for putting this on the table, and I would like to just comment um, why. Um, got a real problem with any candidate that basically in this case, one of our assembly reps who's running makes the point that um, uh, 
he, he basically feels the donation that he gave, um, in spite of the fact that he says he's pro-life, went to basically 100% pro-abortion individual, and then tries to cover that up by the fact that his company uh, more or less requested or required him to do that, and that therefore he felt he had to do it. And then at the very end, tries to say that those who are bringing this forth for the electorate to understand this situation are basically using smear politics against me. Um, I just uh, kind of slurred by the last line. Um, and I, I, I leave it at that, I guess. The only other thing I'd like to share for a minute, to David, is some of you knew we went down, you mentioned Stites' campaign. I went down, Ruth and Gus, uh, last uh, Saturday and um, spent the day down there doing the uh, lift drop work. Um, it was an interesting day in many respects. Um, you know, there is a fight, obviously, very obvious there. And you see the, uh, the signs oftentimes for uh, Van Wangard and Robin Voss, and you see Van Wangard and Paul Ryan. Um, and then we find out they've been taking down, they, this is Republicans against Republicans, folks. Uh, I'm supporting states, no, no apologies, but fair, is fair, fairness in politics is extremely important. And when people are taking down four foot by eight foot signs against states, we I mean, know it's not the Democrats. We understand we got dirty, dirty pool being played here, big time. Um, last thing I'm going to say is I made this before, I'm going to make it again. When any organization like the Conservatives, to elect a Republican Senate are going to use my funds and some of your funds that you've donated to wade into the primary, which they're doing in the Sykes and Van Vanguard case. They're using their money to try to get Vanguard elected. I donated that organization. I will never donate to it again because they're using our money, not in the general, but in the primary to select a candidate to the leadership in the establishment wants. That we need to fight. Um, so with that, I think um, um, I'll rest my case and say thank you. Brian, why don't you react to that quick and then we gotta get some announcements in. Sure, well, I, you know, I, I don't know about the local assembly race, but you know, this is something we've seen time and time again in primaries where people say that facts are suddenly smear campaigns. And I, you know, regardless of where you end up on a, supporting a candidate or opposing a candidate, I don't think that facts are part of a smear campaign. You know, dirty politics is whenever you go into someone's past and you dredge up rumors or you make personal attacks against them, their, their, their livelihood, or their, um, you, know, you talk about their family in a way and their family is actually not involved in the campaign, that would be dirty politics. But if someone has put themselves out there and they've cast votes on issues, or if they've given money to political candidates or to organizations, that is part of the public record. That is very fair for anybody to look at, to question. And if there's a legitimate answer, fine. In this case, again, I don't know who you're commenting about, but if, if he felt a corporation was requiring him to give the money, then you know, we do have ethics rules and campaign finance rules that talk about that and there was actually a railroad executive who uh, ran into some substantial legal trouble because he was requiring employees to give to certain candidates so there's precedent for dealing with issues like that and certainly anything in the public record uh, is valid to be talked about now if you talk about unsubstantiated allegations or rumors I think that's dirty politics that shouldn't happen but if it's in the public record it's fair game and it should be fully debated as part of the primary process Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank Brian. you.